Where do I start? Where do I begin? How do I start? Hello again, Unlimited. It's David Taylor here, and this week I am joined by a great friend of mine and someone who I hugely admire, uh, Mr. Tom Fitzsimons. Hi there, Tom. How are you today? Hi, David. How are you doing? I'm good. Great to have you on the call today, Tom. And for those of you who don't know Tom, and, and, and I know that, that a lot of my local tribe will know Tom very well, uh, but for those of you beyond the Yorkshire area, you might not have come across Tom. The reason why I wanted to, wanted to speak with Tom today and the reason why I've had Tom come and speak at my events and we've, we've had some great conversations together in the past is he's done something quite remarkable. Uh, and that's what I'd like to explore today and dive in today. Well, actually, Tom, I've said what that remarkable thing is. Would you like to share what that remarkable thing is in your words? Uh, it depends what the remarkable thing is, because I think I've got a couple of remarkable things. <laughs> um, if, well, that's true, talking, actually. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Um, that's I mean, true though. It'd be interesting to see what your um, idea of the remarkable thing is, because mine is, is recovery from addiction, eight years in recovery, um, and that's probably my, my, my most remarkable thing to date in my life um, that, that I'm so proud of. Well, I suspect you're thinking of or talking about running across the United States of America, which was also pretty cool as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> r- yeah, I, I think I think by most people's standards, running across the United States of America is pretty remarkable. Um, and, and actually, it's, it's interesting what you say about, you know, you're absolutely right, because context is everything. And, and, and you say that you, you've had a number of remarkable things. And I guess in my mind, I was kind of putting them hand in hand because I think the way I've understood your story is that they do go hand in hand. And I'd love to, to understand a little bit more about that. Um, so let's, let's, let's dive in with that. So if you talk about addiction, tell us a little bit about that journey. Tell us a little bit about that journey of kicking addiction. Uh, well, I suppose you, you've you've got to really um, start at well, you're starting at the end, as it were, um, of a of yeah. a, a, a pretty horrific journey um, of of self destruction, um, and people talk about getting to rock bottom, um, and and this is the po- point where you start to change and you start to make make changes. For me, it, uh, I don't think there ever was a rock bottom. Um, I read a quote the other night: the rock bottom was the foundation, which I built my life. I think it was J.K. Rowling or someone's claimed that one. Um, but it, it was it, there wasn't a rock bottom because I could see myself going lower and lower and lower and lower, and and almost to the point where I couldn't see a bottom. It was a bottomless pit, um, and it was only one day when um, I, I'd been involved in in some sort of recovery, trying to recover myself, trying to stop drinking. And the reasons I was trying to stop drinking was because my wife Zoe, my partner. Um, of 14 years was now starting to get to the point where she she had had enough and it's okay me having enough but it, I could cope with that but I couldn't cope with my partner having enough um, and looking at and understanding that she was about to leave with my two youngest children um, Orla and Oliver who were at the time three and one year old um, and I think it was at that moment that things started change things started to unravel things started to become real recovery became real um up until that point i was trying to just hang on i would pretend i was getting into recovery and it would buy me another couple of months but at that particular time in my life it was real it was a real moment where i could say that zoe was serious about this and i had to i had to jump in i had to say recovery was the only way forward um, and I started that difficult journey um, to try and get myself sober um, f- from that particular point. And I remember you talk about that journey where you started to get sober. And and for some reason, you decided to start running. So I'd love it if you could share a little bit of that because... Uh, it didn't sound like an easy, an obvious decision for you to make at the time. It, it was. I mean, I, well, I went through, I went through the recovery process um, 
I, I, when I talk in my keynote speech about um, the recovery process, uh, seven days, I, uh, we condensed it down to seven days. It probably went on for a little bit longer than seven days, but the vomiting, the sickness, the paranoia, the hallucinations, the feelings of, of suicidal feelings all um, came almost to a crescendo to the point where I need to do something more. There has to be something else than sitting in this room um, crying and wanting to die because addiction is, is so powerful that it wants to drag you back into its world. So I decided that, you know, there must be something else. And I'd heard about somebody talking about running and running helps with depression. It helps with all sorts of different mental health issues. So maybe it might help with my addiction. And it was like, it was almost like one of those moments where I thought, right, I'm just going to stick a pair of shorts on, get an old jumper on. I'm going to go out at night because I was 19 stone by that stage and I was very embarrassed of physically how I'd let myself go. Um, and I got myself into a point where I went out for a run and I ran for half a mile. And I, uh, Half a mile was it. That was my limit. I couldn't ever run um, any more than half a mile. I came back home, vomited all over the bathroom and swore I'd never go running again, David. It was just not for me. Uh, I was 19 stone. I was sore. I was sweaty. I was um, gasping for air. And it surely wasn't the answer. And there had to be something else apart from running. But at that moment, I had something, a feeling inside. And this feeling inside, um, I now know, was, was happiness. And I haven't felt happy since I was about 50 years of age. Um, I've been doing a lot of thinking about happiness over the last few few, few days because it's almost coming up to the anniversary of me moving to England 30 years ago. And I didn't, I don't remember happiness from about six years of age onwards. Um, until that point of running. And that moment of happiness was enough to make me go running the next night and then the next night. Um, and I, Within you know six weeks, I'd run a 10K, within three months, I'd run a half marathon. So uh, that particular moment was just a simple case of desperation. There has to be something else other than sitting in a bedroom, sweating and being paranoid and vomiting and, and hallucinating. There has to be something else it can help me through that difficult period, and thankfully for me, running was a thing I picked up. It could have been, it could have been drawing, it could have been writing, and subsequently it has become drawing and writing and all those sorts of things. But um, you know, at that particular time, it was running, and thankfully for me, it was running because it was such a, a powerful tool to put on my arsenal. Mm. And when you, when we've spoken about this in the past, one thing you've talked about is that. You started running, and you kind of created this bizarre contract with yourself that if I could run a mile, then I could go and have a pint of beer. Yeah, it was the classic um, alcoholic. It was, it was, you know, I would go six miles, drink six pints, eight miles, eight pints. Um, so yeah, it was a classic alcoholic, David. And um, I, I was better than everyone else, and that's what I convinced myself. I, I didn't have to be alcoholics and all of us because, you know, all I had to do was drink or all I had to do was run, sorry. And, and, and you know, I could I could do whatever I want, but I was better than every other alcoholic out there. And it turns out I wasn't. It turns out I was the exact same as the rest of them, David. It turns out that um, I, I, nobody's any better than anyone. Um, I'm the same person as the, the person who's living on the streets. I'm the same person... And I had to stop drinking for, for good, forever, um, for a lifetime, for eternity. I couldn't go back to it. Um, but I didn't realize that at the time. And what was that point? What was that tipping point from you were running, you'd, sense, you'd had that sense of happiness, and you started to connect with yourself, and you got healthier, and yet you were still drinking? What was the tipping point that allowed you to keep running and stop drinking? I, I'd been on a, a rugby weekend and, and done the entire weekend without any alcohol. Um, uh, I, I'd had a very good weekend and realised then at the end of the weekend that um, I, I wanted a drink. Um, so I'd done three days away with the men um, and I decided I wanted a drink and that descended into a month a month of drinking. Um, and that was it. My, my partner turned around to me and said, Enough now, Tom. You know, you've know you been in the pub for a month and you've not run a mile. You're, you're, you're an alcoholic. You have to sit down and, and understand this principle that you, abstinence is the only way. And, and I've argued this with many alcoholics and, and drug addicts in the past. Abstinence for me is the only way forward in this journey. 
Um, and I know some people, I think Alison Campbell famously um, has an alcohol issue and he, he uses alcohol every now and again, as he calls it, to test himself. I think that's a dangerous way to be. So for me, it was abstinence. Um, and from August 27, 2007, uh, I sat down and said, right, okay, I'm going to become a runner. I'm going to be known as the guy who likes to run, not as the guy who likes a pint. Uh, and that was one of the moments when I said to myself, this is how I want to be known. Um, when people refer to me in my local village, it would be, oh yeah, Tom, he likes a drink. And, I, I, and that's how I was defined. It was Tom who likes a drink. And I, I'd, I'd got to the point where I wanted to show people that you could just run and you didn't have to drink. Um, I was tired of people saying to me, well, you can do a little bit of both, Tom, or you'll never get rid of the drink because that's who you are. Um, and they define you by that. And I've been defined as Tom the drunk for from the ages of 13 to 33. I was just Tom the drunk. Um, and I wanted to change that. I want to show people that you can change who you are. You can, you're not just defined by your actions of the past. Um, and, and unfortunately for me, it took a, it took a while to, for that to sink in, to realise that I could reinvent myself. And it is a reinvention. It's not it's not just a um, you know all of a sudden I turned into Tom the Runner. I had to reinvent. I had to learn new skills. I had to learn how to be this new new character because this new character Tom was was alien to me. I didn't actually like him to be honest with you, David. Don't tell anyone about that. But I didn't like this new character. <laughs> it, you know, it was he was a bit of a bore. He was a bit boring at times. He was a bit too sensible. He's almost like a, a monk. He was a brother. He was a you know he was a you know. This guy who was pious, he was, look at me, I'm eating the right foods and I'm losing weight and I'm not drinking alcohol and I'm doing all these things that I always, for 20 years I went, I would have, I would have avoided Tom Fitzsimons like the plague rather than being in his company. So what I love about what you're saying there, Tom, is, is two things because I'm sure you know in Coaching Unlimited, we love to play this game of what I don't want you to know about me. And I guess what you don't want me to know about you is that maybe Tom the Runner was a, a little bit different to what you expected. And, <laughs> but, but I think there's a, a bigger point here, and a, something that feels really important to me, and something which I love to play with as a coach, is this idea of identity. And I love how you created a very simple, but immensely powerful new identity of Tom the Runner. And you talk about, you started to talk about there about it, it sounds simple, but actually it wasn't necessarily as simple as it looks. So I'd love it if you could dive in a little bit more from just thinking about it, is how did you create that new identity, that new way of being? Well, identity is probably something that I've struggled with and continue to struggle with um, from the age of, um, you know, negative identity is always what I've, I've been associated with. Um, as, a, as a child growing up in Belfast, I was the son of a, a drug addict. Well, first and foremost, we were the we were Irish Catholics in Northern Ireland, which I'm not going to get into political debate, but we were second-class citizens for quite a number of years. Um, then my father, so I was a second-class citizen in my own country. My father was a drug addict, so I was a second-class citizen with a drug addict father. And then my father lost his job um, because of his drug addiction. So I was the second-class citizen of a drug addict and um, now unemployed. Um, so we had no money. We we're very, you know, poor background. Um, so identity has always been negative identity. When we moved to England, it was supposed to be a positive new start. We moved to England, and I was the Irish kid, which, as we all know, in the 1980s, David was not a, was not a tagline you wanted. It was a pretty rough yeah. thing to be the Irish kid in England in the 1980s. Um, so again, a negative identity. And then my father, um, sadly, you know, passed away in 88 by choking to death on his own vomit. It wasn't even a cool way to die. Um, and I was now the son of somebody who choked to death on his own vomit. So all my identities all the way through um, have been negative, the, the alcoholic negative. And all of a sudden, I was trying to create this new positive identity. And being, having a positive identity was completely alien to me. I had no idea of how to be a positive person, how to be a positive role model to my children, how to be a positive uh, attitude to life, have a positive attitude to work. I had no idea how to do any of this. It was literally learn on the job, get out and do it. I knew what I wanted to see, 
in my positive identity. I'd seen certain individuals who were, um, as I would say, people who I looked up to, people who I liked, people who I thought, yeah, they, they, they've made a difference in the world and I'd like to be like them. Now, sadly, one of them has, has since been found out to be a complete and utter fraud, Lance Armstrong. I mean, you know, it was one of my, you know, my idols as I was in recovery. Lance Armstrong was probably the one person I looked up to, and it's a completely different illness, cancer and addiction, but it's still an illness. So I would look up to him as if to say, well, if he can change from being this guy who's been defined as a guy who has cancer to being the top rider in the world, then I can change from being Tom Simons the drunk to being Tom Simons the runner. And it was looking for people who could be that positive energy that I could create a positive identity. My wife didn't understand who this positive Tom was. Um, and I had to understand that, that she, she was, uh, rightly or wrongly, it was like her getting into a relationship with a completely new man. Um, she, she didn't know this new Tom. And also for me, I didn't know Zoe, my partner, sober. I, I didn't understand this sober. Every relationship I'd had with her, all the conversations I'd had, I'd been drunk. So I had to learn all these new skills. So creating this new positive identity um, was something I just, I looked for inspiration from other people. Um, I understood my own moral code, which was, um, you know, I brought up as a Christian. I knew I wanted to live a Christian life, a good, honest Christian life. And, uh, and I followed that, that blueprint. And I've made, I've made lots and lots of changes along the way. And I've made lots and lots of mistakes along the way. But I think at the end of it, I've created an identity of Tom for Time as the runner. Um, and I think that's been successful. I think you know, one thing I'm curious about in that identity is I, I have a belief that, and I want to talk about your extraordinary uh, thing in a moment, the, the running across America, and I know your other things are extraordinary too, but I, I want to bring come to that one in a moment. But to me, something like that, something like that extraordinary, is, is of itself is not extraordinary. It's actually the ordinary things that we do every day. It's the ordinary things that we do day in, day out, and they create something extraordinary. What I've noticed about what you're saying and, and what I know of you is you were able to create those new habits, even though that first time you went running, it left you sweating and vomiting and hating it in the moment. You still went running the next day and the next day and the next day. I'm curious yeah. as to what it was. How were you able to consistently do that? And I know from your recent experience, you know, you, I, I know that you're working on doing a triathlon now. And, and we were just talking about cycling. We've both got the same turbo trainer, which is kind of like a rolling road for bikes, if you don't know what that is. And I know that you go into the gym and you do 30 minutes, you do 60 minutes on the, on the, the, on the bike in the gym, even though it's mind-numbingly boring. What has it enabled you to do that consistently day after day? I think um, having been a, a drunk for 20 years, I, I knew what the word um, you've mentioned a couple of times. There. It's one of my favorite words, consistency. Um, and, and again, you can have positive consistency and negative consistency. I, I consistently destroyed myself for 20 years. And I knew that that consistency creates results. It does. It creates results. Um, what, what, what people don't I, I, by realize. By the way, Tom, I, I, I just love that spin on it because it certainly created some results for you in those first 20 years, didn't it? It did. It did. It, did. it created fantastic results. It created a 19 stone violent drunk. It was consistent with the stuff that I was doing. So consistently, if, I, if you destroy yourself with alcohol, you will get those results consistent with that behavior. So I knew that somewhere mm. along the line, and I also. My mother always brought us up to be hardworking and, and understand that, that hard work eventually will get results. Um, and, and it might not be the results you, you were expecting, but you will get some sort of results. So my mindset has always been that if I'm consistent, if I get up and do this and do this and do this and do this and repeat this process, if I repeat it in a negative context, it will, it will get negative results. So surely if I create something positive and repeat the process day after day after day, I will get consistent results with positive behavior. And I did. So every day I would go out and I would run. 
and there would be days that when I would run, you know, seven days, seven days a week with blisters the size of, you know, ten pence pieces on my feet. I would have sore knees. I would have, you know, ankle pain. I would have had a big toe problem for two years, and I ran through them. Um, and, and it was almost that thing, you know, if I, I need to keep this consistency. I almost became obsessed with consistency. That you just do it. The swimming at the moment, I, I, we're talking about triathlon. I don't, I, up until October last year, I don't, I cu- couldn't swim. So what did I do? I was consistent. I arrived at the pool every day for, you know, from October to Christmas um, with a coach. And I did the same drill every day, every day, every day. And I got results consistent with that effort. And for me, that was, that's what I've always done. I understand that consistency gives you results because I've learned that over 20 years of being consistently negative towards myself and that created results. So I, I think that's where it all comes from. My determination to keep on going forward and regardless of the pain and regardless of the setbacks, just keep on moving forward has come from a, from a, a, an inbuilt ability to either destroy or build myself. Um, and I was very good at destroying myself and I'm equally as good at rebuilding myself. And I think we all are. We can. We all can do that in equal measure um, if we are consistent in equal measure. So if you're consistent negatively, you will get consistently negative results. Consistency, positive, you will get positive results. Unfortunately, for, for m- many of us, um, we don't identify quickly enough what's a negative and what's a positive. So, you know, that's what I've been able to do. I've been able to identify it quickly. But this running thing, this thing that, I always thought was alien to myself and to everyone else around me. This running thing that only mad people did in the 1980s um, was consistent and it was going to get me results. So I stuck at it. I, that's an, uh, I was kind of, I'm taken back by that, Tom, because there's such powerful distinctions in there about consciousness and awareness and consistency and taking action. Uh, uh, and I just want to sort of take that in. It's so powerful. And, I, and actually what I want to do now is, is actually take that power that you described and how you took that and added in a man called Felix and created something extraordinary. Yeah, Felix Baumgartner, yeah. So tell us, tell us about Felix. Well, I, I'm sure many of the listeners will know Felix Baumgartner was Red Bull Stratos. Uh, this dude was going to go up in a hot air balloon to 120,000 feet in October 2012, and he was going to throw himself out of the balloon, and he was going to free fall for four minutes, and he was going to. He was the most important thing, David. He was going to land it. That was the thing. He wasn't just going <laughs> to throw himself out of a balloon. He was going to land it. Now, when I watched it, I sat there for, for hours thinking, I hope he's actually going to do this because. I'm sitting here watching this hot air balloon going up, and people will remember this. It was such a dull experience watching this balloon rise into the air. Yeah, it took hours. It took hours, didn't it? Yeah. It did. It took two and a half hours, nearly three hours. But my daughter sat with me. My daughter, Orla, was seven at the time. And she sat with me on my lap, and, I, and she didn't leave. There was something strangely hypnotic about watching this balloon going up to the edge of space. And, and as it went up, the, the balloon got bigger. Um, and you know, as the atmosphere put, you know, allowed it to get bigger, and it was phenomenal. And he, and he opened the he opened the capsule door, and I still remember. And I, actually, as I'm speaking to you now, I'm shutting my eyes, and and I'm seeing Earth as I'd never seen it before. I, I saw the world from a different perspective. I saw the world from a place of of beauty, from a place I'd never seen before, from a place I didn't realise I could see it from. And it was this beautiful glow of energy, this beautiful place that I'd had such a hard time experiencing. I hadn't experienced this world I could see from 120,000 feet. And I suddenly got a moment where I thought, you know what, there's something more for me to do. I've I've got more power within me. I've got more energy. Um, But before I was going to act on it, Felix had to do the jump. (laughs) And he had to to land it. And I sat and watched for four minutes as he free falls with my daughter's heart pumping out of her chest and me thinking she's either going to witness something great or she's going to witness her first ever suicide. Um, it was just one of those moments. He needs to land this. And he pulled his chute. As we all know, the rest is history. He glided to the floor. He landed. 
and he, he, he was, I was so emotional at the end of that, David, that I thought I need to go and do something else. So I sat at my computer desk and I sent an email to a potential opportunity, um, an opportunity that had come to me um, a few months earlier in Berlin when I was speaking at a gig in Berlin. Um, and the chief executive came to me at the end of the gig and said, if you ever need anything, send me an email or give me a call. And I almost missed that opportunity because I put the card in my back pocket, as we do. I know we're not supposed to, David, and you're going to tell me off for this, but I bring my business cards home and I throw them in a box and I never use them again because that's what we do. And anyone that tells you differently is not telling the truth. No, I'm only joking. Obviously, we all act on the cards we're given. I didn't. I left it in my pocket and let put it in the box. And then at that moment, I thought, I need to email this guy because I want to do something spectacular. And I sent him an email asking him for sponsorship to do this spectacular, crazy, wonderful idea that I was going to have a moment like Felix Baumgartner. I was going to have my world is watching moment, which is what Felix described his as. And so tell us about that. What was it you committed to do? And we haven't got time to go into a lot of detail about it today, but... Uh... I would just love to pick out a couple of highlights as to actually what happened next. Well, the, the world is watching moment for me was, as we discussed earlier, it was running across the United States of America. Um, you know, to even contemplate that, some people take years to to um, to achieve those sorts of things. I knew that I wanted to run across from San Francisco to New York City to raise awareness from recovery from addiction. I knew that the power that I had already created in myself and my identity was down to, I needed to share that with people. I needed to share um, the power that I had in my new identity with other alcoholics and drug addicts, but not just alcoholics and drug addicts, anyone that's struggling with life. They had to realize the true potential. And I realized that, you know, my true potential was not just running marathons. It wasn't just running the Marathon de Salvas in 2010, 155 miles through the Sahara Desert. It wasn't starting a new business. It wasn't building a gym in the bottom of the garden. It was being able to do something crazy like running across an entire continent. Um, and when I sent the email away, I didn't tell my wife. I didn't tell anyone else. It was something that was so private to me, but I was determined that that would happen. Thankfully for me, the sponsorship came back. The guy emailed me back and said, yes, we're on. Uh, and then within six months of getting that email, between my, me and my partner, we had set up Run for Sobriety, and I arrived on the Golden Gate Bridge in New York City on May 20th, 2013, ready to run across the United States of America. And I think th- th- there's something more than this as well, which, which those of you who don't know your story will, will not know this. It wasn't simply to run across America. You set out to run across America in 100 days which is about 33, 34 miles a day, which is effectively an ultra marathon every day for 100 days. Is that right? That's right, yeah. yeah. I, I, I wanted to finish um, on my sobriety date. So my sobriety date was August 27th, um, and I wanted to finish the run on that day, so 100 days. I figured that if I just did a marathon a day, um, what was I going to do with the other eight hours a day? I, I needed to do more. There was more hours in the day. There's no point in just going and run the marathon in the day, David. I'll be honest with you. That's not how my mind works. If you're out there, you're going to use it as a job. You might as well run 30 miles as 26. You might as well run 32 as, as 30. So just getting out and doing it. Um, and it was the equivalent of running 122 marathons in, in 95 days of running because I had five days off in the 100 days. So 122 marathons in, in 95 days of running. So it was pretty. it was pretty arduous schedule. It was one of those schedules that I thought after, you know, even after the first six miles, I hadn't thought through properly because I was lost within six miles getting into Oakland. I had no idea where I was going. Um, didn't have any idea of the maps. Everything was on on um, electronic maps, and we didn't have any internet access. So I made a, a big decision that day was just to move east. Just keep moving east, Tom. That's all we have to do, just keep moving east. We had to do a little bit of north. I didn't like going north because... Nobody likes going north and trying to move east, um, especially when you're having to run it. Um, so, but I eventually just got to the point where I just keep moving east. And, and, you know, that whole concept of your body's breaking. And my body was broken, David. My body was broken on a daily basis. I would get into the hotel room at night. I would take some ibuprofen. I would sit in an ice bath. 
and I would pray to God that something would happen miraculously, that I would feel better, and I would, you know, be full of power the next day. And it never happened. Um, you know, it didn't happen. I didn't wake up the next morning full of energy. Um, I, I struggled every single bloody day of that run. Um, you know, and, and I often, <laughs> you know, uh, some people tend to forget the fact that even though I can run, I have no natural ability. I'm not. A, I'm not. A, you know, I'm not a three-hour marathon runner. I, I was still 17 stone at this time. I'd put a load, load of weight on before I went. I was a big dude, um, and I technically I shouldn't be able to do it. But there's something yeah. deep within us all that if you really want to achieve something, as we all know, uh, it's doable in every situation. And it's having that determination and that reason to keep on going uh, and finding those reasons on the road, which I did on, on regular occasions. So, so before you go, I'd like, you, I'd, I'd like to invite you to share one little story from that. I know you, I know you share this in, when you talk. Um, it's a story that I love that I think it was before you got halfway, I think it was in the, in the earlier days where you'd got to a point where you just wanted to give up. And you were, you said you were at the roadside on your knees. If you were, if you're okay to share that little, that little story, I'd, I'd love it if you could share that with everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was only, I was actually through the, the highway 50, the loneliest road in America. Um, and, uh, if anyone who knows America, um, the highway 50 was the old pony express. So it was barren land. This place is just desolate. There's nothing there. Um, and the car count was about 50 cars a day where it had been 400 cars a minute. You know, it was now 50 cars a day. Uh, and I, I was doing my morning prayer. I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a Christian, so I, I pray every day. But I, the good thing about being in solitude is I could pray to God as I'm speaking to you now. And I'm having a bit of a moan. And I'm saying to, because, you know, I, I started my usual prayer. As, as we all know, God, God's a Yorkshireman. So I went, hey up God, here we go. Um, I'm having a really bad day. You know, I've got sore knees. I torn my cartilage before I even set off on the journey. So I was running with a torn cartilage. My knee was sore. I'd got sunburned the day before. I was hungry. I was tired. Um, I was rallying with my brother, who was a support driver, and we were, there was a bit of tension in the camp. And I was saying to God, haven't I suffered enough? Haven't I done enough for you? Haven't I, you know, left my children for four months to come on this journey? Haven't I battled addiction and beaten addiction and done all these sorts of things? Haven't I got over the loss of my father and moving to a new country? You've given me everything. I've taken it all and I've still been a good human being. Surely, God, you can give me a break. And I ranted for five or ten minutes, David, and I said, right, okay, do you know what? I'm, whatever you've got planned, I'm going to leave it. I'm going to trust you. Because as the good book says, I will be done. I'm going to listen to this because I believe you have a plan for me. And I said my prayers and I said, thank you for everything else he was going to do for me from the day. And I prayed for safety and I finished my prayers. And about a minute later, a motorbike pulled up. And a big American dude on this motorbike, you know the type, the Harley Davidson type. And he got off his motorbike and he says, hey man, how you doing? And, and I said, I've had better days, you know, it's, it's not been the best of days. And he said, have you got water? Yes, I've got water. He then said, have you got food? Yes, I've got food. Have you got a place to stay tonight, man? Yes, I've got a place to stay. I was getting a bit tired by the stage of these questions because I thought, where's he going with this? And he got back on his motorbike and he turned around at me and he, just before he started the bike up, he said, good, I'm just making sure you've got what you need. And he rode off. And from that moment on, David, I realized that all my arguments with God, all my frustrations with the situation, everything I complained about in life, I realized in that one moment that God gives us what we need, not what we want. Um, and it was as simple as that. I had food, water, and shelter. I didn't need anything else. I didn't need a camper van. I didn't need steak every night. I didn't need pasta every night. I just needed food. I needed some sugars in me. I needed some fats, and that's all I needed. Uh, and God gives us what we need, not what we want. We often get what we need in life. We very rarely get what we want. It's nice if we do get what we want every now and again, but usually if we get what we need, we eventually will get to what we want. We will get to where we need to be. We will get to be with who we want to be with 
if we just focus on what we need. And that, for me, was the most beautiful moment of the entire journey. Because from then on in, and there's still a long way to go from Nevada, you know, I still have quite a few states to get through. I realized that in any situation, any time I was moaning, God was giving me what I needed and not what I wanted. And as long as I got what I needed, I would get to New York City. And hey, I got to New York City, so he gave me what I needed. Um, and that was two feet and a heart the size of a lion. <sighs> Tom, it has been such a pleasure to speak with you. You're one of my favorite people to listen to. And it is, uh, you've just shared so many gems uh, in, in the last 25 minutes. Thank you so much. Um, Always good to speak to you, David. I uh, really appreciate it, Tom. And you have a book. So, so what I'd like to do is just, if you want to take, take a few seconds and tell the listeners about your book uh, and also where they can find you. How can, how can they get in touch with you? Yeah, my book's called It's Not About the Beard. Um, the title's explained in the introduction. It's a bit of a long-winded one, but yeah, It's Not About the Beard. It's available via my website, uh, tomfordsimons.co.uk or via Amazon. Um, and it's available on Kindle and all other types of electronic devices. Um, and it's, so far, it's, it's getting some good reviews, so I'm, I'm quite pleased with it. I'm very proud of it. And again, you can contact me via uh, my Facebook account or sorry, via Twitter, at drying out. I'm on Facebook and also via the website tomfitsimons.co.uk. Thank you so much, Tom, and I look forward to seeing you uh, again soon. And just have an amazing day, and we'll speak soon. Bye bye, my friend. Thank you. Cheers, David.